dudes, welcome to Splat from the Past, the only 80s themed horror and sci-fi show where things can get totally radical. Now today, I will be welcoming one of the great New York actors, character actors, I should say, as well. I am talking about Chris Murney. Chris Murney, you all know as the bad guy, Eddie Arcadia, in the 1985 cult classic, The Last Dragon, which is celebrating its 35th anniversary this year. He was also in Paul Newman's movie Slapshot. He was on the short-lived series, The San Pedro Beach Bums. He was in Barton Fink. He was in The Secret of My Success, Maximum Overdrive, so many great cult classics. I'm having him on the show today to talk about all of those, and it's going to be pretty awesome. It's going to be a lot of fun. So yeah, here is my interview with Chris Murney. Hello, Tommy. Hey, Chris. Welcome to the show, sir. How are you today? I'm fine, thank you. How about yourself? Pretty good. Pretty good. Really hot day today. It's damn hot here, I'll tell you. So I had to move around. I found this spot. Yeah. Under the green here with that. And it's winds coming out of the southeast, so it's humid. Mm hmm. It's nasty here. Yeah, it's pretty nasty here. It's been um, since last night. Overnight, it was pretty bad. But um, this is a great honor. Thank you for taking the time today. My pleasure, Tony. My pleasure. So going back in time, uh, did you gravitate toward acting early on in your childhood? No, I actually, I was thinking about this, and so I didn't quite know what we were going to be talking about. And I went, how did I get into this? Ah. I wanted to be, I studied oceanography. I wanted to be, because I grew up in the ocean, mm -hmm. of the ocean, thought that's what I wanted to do. Unfortunately, I, I couldn't quite pass the mathematics involved in, in oceanography. Mm -hmm. So I uh, just went into other interests, just flopped around for a while. And then finally I uh, went into the hotel business, hotel management, studied that at the University of New Hampshire, and then ended up on a date one night with a woman who was in the theater department, and uh, they were having auditions for uh, Richard of Venice. Mm -hmm. And she said, why don't you audition for it? And I said, okay. And that was it. So I ended up getting a role in that, and uh, played Antonio, as I remember. And uh, I never left it. That was it. So you can say it was women who got me involved in the theater. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think that's the case for most actors. Yep. Wow. Wow. So you had never at least done a school play before that? I, I, I may have done something in high school. I vaguely remember something in high school, but I don't remember what it was. Huh. No idea. You, uh, you didn't have any look beyond that. I, it was never a, uh, at that time, I didn't think about it. It wasn't anything that was on my front burner. Mm -hmm. And one day it was. Yeah. Uh, you were born and raised in Rhode Island? Yeah, I was born and raised in Narragansett uh, on the ocean, well, right close to it. And um, went to high school there, went to the University of Rhode Island, where I uh, studied, that's where I studied uh, oceanography and also astronomy. <laughs> I had one math class with a I remember the prof told me, I'm going to ask you in this course if you promise me to never, ever go into anything involving mathematics. I said, okay, <laughs> I'm taken. So that was then I, in my, then I transferred to the University of New Hampshire. Mm -hmm. Did you also go to Penn State? I did. I went to there, there for graduate school in theater. And that was in acting and directing. And then from there, did you go to New York? Um, no, from there I went to uh, uh, John Jory, who was starting the Actors Theater of Louisville. Mm -hmm. uh, he called me up and said, hey, I, I had just been offered a job at the Guthrie, and uh, I had accepted it. And uh, John called me up and said, well, I'm starting this theater at uh, an Actors Theater in Louisville, Kentucky. Um, would you like to join me? And a couple of other people that I do also. And I said, John, I just, just got this offer to do uh, to do the Guthrie. He said, uh, well, they let you direct. I said, well, wh when did you want me there? And that was that. Was that. I ended up on my 
way to Louisville and stayed there for, I guess, two and a half years, three years. Mm -hmm. And then we did a show uh, that was called, that was written by someone from Broadway, a show called Tricks. Uh, and we did that at, at Actors Theater, and then we did it at the Arena Stage. And then the next thing we were going to Broadway with it. Wow. And the only two the Detroit Fisher Theater in Detroit for, a, I don't know, a two or three week run. I don't remember the dates or how long. And that was the out of town trial, as, as I recall. And then we opened at the the old Alvin, now the Neil Simon Theater on on 51st. Wow. That's, that must have been amazing. Must have been an amazing time for you. It was a, it was a wonderful it was a, a good friend who just passed away last year, Rene Abrugia was in it with me and uh, he played the Scapan role in my play his sidekick. And uh, it was a wonderful time, it was a crazy time. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I I ended up getting some some nice write ups from that and as a result of it stayed in New York and did not go back. To uh, to Louisville or to the arena, I just stayed in stayed in New York City, mm -hmm. and uh, that was it. I never, I did go out to LA for in the seventies for three years. Um, I did a series uh, in the mid, early mid seventies. Mm -hmm. It didn't last long. I think it was one season called the San Pedro Palms. Yeah, <laughs> and. Uh, I did that, and then I ended up doing some guest spot shots on MASH, and before that, I was out there because Victor Joy, who was John's father, right. asked me to go out and do a film with him called uh, The Teachings of Don Juan, which was a by, written by Carlos Castaneda. It's a oh, yeah. Film, actually. Yeah. And, and, and so I said, okay, sure, I'd love to. And I went out, and of course, it never got done. And while I was there, I ended up doing some show called the DA. I can't, can't even remember who was at. It was my first TV series that I did. I think I just did one. I, I don't know if it ever ran until maybe it did. But, uh, I did that and MASH and some other stuff and then went back to, uh, then I went back to Actors Theater, but that was before Broadway. That was pre-Broadway. Mm -hmm. the, the DA, I think that was Robert Conrad. Yes. Yes, it was. Yeah. Thank you. You did do your homework. Yeah, and Jack Webb produced it. It was, kind of, it was kind of a dra it was kind of a dragnet series type of show. <laughs> yeah, it was. It was that. It was that. Yeah. So how how does uh, Slapshot come into your life? Um, one day I was well, I was in the city. I got a call from my agent saying that. Uh, Ruth, 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 that was her last name. She's passed away. She's a casting woman. Little, short, about five feet tall, sweet, grandmotherly type. I uh, wanted to see in this movie. Somebody backed out. So I said, okay, I can, uh, I'll be it. Love to. What, what's it for? They said, it's a movie. It's, it's a hockey movie. Can you skate? I said, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, it's called Slapshot, and uh, she'd like to meet you. So I went in and I heard she said to me, okay, Chris, I'd like you to, I know this sounds odd, but uh, would you just, uh, can you just swear at me? I said, I'm sorry, what? <laughs> just, just, yeah, no, give me, give it to me, just swear at me. So I went off on a booster. Yes, every name, it was just, I could see her gray hair uh, lying back in her head. Yeah. She said, I think George Roy Hill would like to meet you. We're going to send you down to... Johnston, Pennsylvania, Johnstown, PA, uh, tomorrow, if you do know. Shit, I'm not doing anything. So I went down the next day and uh, had to meet Paul and George. And then I, once I met George, he said, okay, now you and Paul work out a fight scene, which we did. And they made sure that I wasn't going to really clock him. And uh, once they realized that I could control that part of it and could escape, he said, well, you got a job if you want it. I said, well, you call my agent, and I guess we're good to go. Mm -hmm. I hung out there for about four or five days because it was due to start shooting almost immediately. Uh, but unfortunately, or 
unfortunately, depending on how you look at it, the, jet, the old Johnstown Jets had gotten into the uh, hockey playoffs in that league. And as a result, the rink was busy, was taken. So everything was held up. So I stayed there. We partied, hardy for a while. And uh, then they sent me back to New York. And then they flew me back down again. And then I'd sit around for four days. And they'd fly me back to New York. And then they'd bring me back down again. And mm-hmm. finally, Trip Paul and I, we shot for our scenes. And uh, had a great time. It was a wonderful Wonderful man. What a great human being. Yeah. And, uh, he, he became my eye open at that time. And um, we finished that, and uh, off we went. And I never thought anything more of it until maybe 20 years had passed, and I didn't realize it was such a cult film. Yeah. It, it boggles my mind that he would do a movie like this because, you know, um, hockey at that time, you know, was just considered a, a Canadian sport, you know, and the fact that it has politically incorrect humor and, you know, he's such a distinguished actor from the actor's studio, it just, it boggles the mind that he would do a movie like that, you know? And, and I, I, it was because of George, because they had done uh, uh, Sunday, uh, Bruce Cassidy. And The Sting. Uh, and The Sting together, so he, he had a relationship with George, and George had this script, and he loved it. He all loved that script. We had a, he had a great time on that set and mm-hmm. that movie. We had a lot of fun. It was just raucous and crazy and just, it was like the movie. It was just freewheeling. Yeah. And the script was written on the fly, and kind of, once George got what he wanted, he would just say, do something you like. Go ahead, do what you want. I remember one time we had, at the end of my scene, which is, I mean, relatively brief for the movie, but uh, he, I went into the stand, into the uh, penalty box after Paul, after I got into the big fight with him, and then he was in the penalty box, and they threw me out of the game, supposedly, and I turned around and go after him. Well, we shot it at the end of it before lunch. Mm-hmm. We came back from lunch, and we had shot it, I don't know, three or four, five, six times. We got back from lunch, and... We started to do it, and I said, Jesus, I, George, I can't get over the damn boards because my legs are shot. <laughs> they were. And so I, he said, well, what do you want to do? I said, well, we'll just build a ramp. <laughs> so, they, so they did. They took a piece of four by eight plywood, just gave me about a, a slight incline so I could get some some impetus as I ran into the boards and up the ramp and over the, over the boards and on the ball. <laughs> that was a lot. That was, we were both, after that scene, Paul pulled the groin muscle, and I pulled, I pulled, we both pulled muscles from that scene. Mm-hmm. Because standing on, doing the fight scene and pulling your punches and pushing the weight where it is, it, it takes a toll on you, and especially if, I mean, skating is one thing, but pulling punches and then uh, being up in that form, uh, it takes a toll after about three hours. Doing yeah. It. So, yeah. Back the movie up for about ten days after that. Wow, <laughs> that, it's a tough sport. Was awesome. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure, Universal wasn't too happy with that, but that's it. Was Paul was out? He couldn't do it for for a little while. Yeah. And it, you, had, and you guys had such a great cast in general. I mean, there was Strother Barton, Jerry Hauser, Michael Antikin, Brad Sullivan, and uh, the Hanson guys. Well, we're still in, we're, we still get together now and again for charity golf tournaments and uh, mm-hmm. uh, with uh, Dave and uh, Jeff Carlson and uh, also Paul DeMond, a good friend uh, who played uh, the Kraken. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, Michael, Mike Ankeen, another story, is he was at the University of New Hampshire the mm-hmm. same time I was. Mm-hmm. So we, he knew me from the theater department and he would play hockey for UNH at the time. Yeah. It was a much smaller world back then. I mean, you could go to school with somebody and then be in a movie with them. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. Going... Uh, mm-hmm. go- you go ahead. I was going to say, go, going back to the uh, San Pedro Beach Bums, um, I talked to uh, Stuart Pankin a couple years ago, and uh, 
he, he told me he was disappointed that the show got canceled so quick. He, he thought this it was going to be his breakthrough. Uh, he said he was really passionate about playing that character. It was, a, I, it was a lot of fun. It was a grueling schedule. It's an hour-long comedy, mm-hmm. which, which is a long to shoot in, in five days. Uh, and it was one camera. One camera film. And as a result, I think it, it was... It was it were hard to crack crank out those scripts. Now I don't know why it didn't sell. That was neither here nor there. I I enjoyed it. I and the people that we we worked together well had a lot of fun with each other. And mm-hmm. Enjoyed do, doing it. But when it got to be Friday and you were shooting sixteen hours, and I didn't do that again for about thirty years when I was doing Remember When. Mm-hmm. That was they were brutal brutal hours. But it was just, I think, it, it, the lead-in, the ABC lead-in to it, as I recall, we were leading into Monday Night Football. Mm-hmm. And I don't know if that was a a, a good thing. I, th- I think it was a bad thing, quite frankly. Yeah. That, it was, you th- that was a long time ago. That was 70, when, you have to, when was that, 75? 77. 77, okay. You think maybe the show was a little ahead of its time, too? You did the TV series remake, miniseries remake of From Here to Eternity. Right. That's right. I forgot about that one. Yeah. Yeah. How, um, how was that experience? <laughs> you just caught me off guard because I forgot about that. <laughs> it, uh, Jesus. It was, I can't, I'm trying to put it in my head now. It, it was at the Universal, no, which lot was it? Anyway, uh, it was it was fine. It was, it was I, I don't have a, a big recall of that doing that one. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, that, that one I had just slipped through my slipped through my brain cells. Do you remember anything though about Natalie Wood? <sighs> uh, only that she was a very lovely person, and everyone. Everyone on set seemed to get along very well with everyone else. There were never any, not many shows that I was involved were had a lot of tensions, and there were certainly none on that set. Mm-hmm. Um, That's good. So, the, that, no, that was, she was just a lovely person. I mean, that's, everyone was very professional. I remember that. Nobody was saying, who's late, who's running late, who's being a team. None of that. It was just, everybody knew their, Move their lines, hit their spots. No, that's good. And, and didn't fall over the furniture. I mean, that was basically. I don't have any strong memory of that, uh, and I don't know why. Uh, I think that I think it was one of uh, Kim Basinger's first things that she ever did too. Wow. Well, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Now we um, get to the Last Dragon, which is celebrating its 35th anniversary. 
how did uh, this come to you? Uh, I uh, okay. I remember getting the call. Agent called up, said Barry Gordy wants to meet you for this uh, this this movie. Here's the script. Da -da -da. Said, oh, okay. Well, where, when do you want? He wants to see you Thursday. It looks like this was a Monday. So I studied the script, and then I kind of then I got into it. I liked it. I thought it was. I didn't see it the way it was written. It was a little different when as it as it evolved on set. And I which I liked and which they let us do. Uh, but I remember putting on a cashmere coat, long coat, mm -hmm. that's been a set in a tux, which I never wear. And drove down it was in the city and went to the audition. And audition with Barry Gordy and Whatever I did, I don't remember exactly what I did, which scene from the film. But he loved it. He just said, oh, Jesus, okay. And um, do you want to do this? He just offered it to me right there. I said, sure, absolutely. And that was it. And that's how I got it. And then when we started filming, it was very, it was loose. It was, I kind of played with the script a lot. And mm -hmm. at first, I don't think he liked it, many did. And uh, we had a good time. We had, uh, again, there was uh, a lot of ad living, a lot of ad living, and, and those, a lot of those lines, uh, like, we don't want to look like a little piggy feet in our eyes, now do we? Or, <laughs> where'd these guys come from? I didn't know they out. Uh, stuff like that was just thrown away, but it was, it was ad lived and it stayed in. Yeah. It sounds like uh, you were his first choice. That I don't know. He didn't say if he had anybody else in mind. But once he asked me, I said, I'm, I'm, I'm down with that. That's great. Yeah. And it was, I, I do remember Barry Barry. He always had two bodyguards with him. Did he meet two? <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, well, he's the founder of Motown. <laughs> That's right. He had, he had two, one on each side. They weren't. And they were watching you like a hawk. He's a great guy. I met him a couple of years ago at a convention, and I had very little cash on me. And I asked um, his handler um, if um, he had a card swiper, and uh, he was he was he was kind of a jerk. He was just uh, doing his job of saying, you know, there's an ATM machine, and I was like, I know, but I have very little cash. But then I ended up walking away, and then Ty Mac uh, got up and grabbed me and said, hey, man, I have a card swiper. And I was like, oh, okay. And then um, got his autograph, got his picture. He was a great guy. He's grown. He's, he's a, well, he's a, he's, what is he, he's 50 now or 49? I don't know. He's 50 or close. He's, yeah, he's got to be at least, um, it, yeah, he's got to be at least um, early 50s. Okay, because it was, if this is 30, you say this is 35 years this year? Yeah. Wow, okay. Uh, boy, now I feel old. <laughs> no wonder I can't remember what the hell happened from here to the journey. It's been that long. <laughs> <laughs> I just looked it up, he's 56. Okay, well, 35 years ago. All right. Yeah. And, um,. I don't. I don't think he had it. Yeah, yeah, he had no uh, prior acting experience. Do you think uh, he did a good job? Yes, I mean he he was he was this young, naive, energetic young man who I thought did a good, very good job with with that. And given the circumstances that he was thrown into and the schedule he had to do, I thought he did a terrific job. Looking back on it, yeah. I mean, those, that guy had some moves, too. I mean, I, I mean, he was studying that, I believe. I mean, he was, he was into that world. Um, but he was just, a, you know, he was very eager. I remember that. And, uh, no, he did, and he did a terrific, as it turned out, a terrific job. I mean, in the evolution of that young character, I thought he did terrific. Mm-hmm. And then um, Vanity, she's so gorgeous and so talented. It's sad she's gone now. Uh, she must have been great yeah. to work with. Yeah, it was. That was she was. That was 
set. And that was, yeah. That was, yeah. She was great, too. Everyone everyone did their job. I mean, my Mike, who played my brother, was a good egg from New Jersey originally. And, uh, and uh, gee, I'm just thinking about Vanity now. Man, that was so sad, man. That whole, that whole thing that she, I guess, and, how many years that she's been gone now? Um, let me see here. 10, 10 or 15 years? Oh, no, she's only been gone four years. Oh, God. Okay. I'm sorry. 2016. Yeah. Wow. And, of course, Michael Schultz, uh, a pioneering director. How was he to work with? He was great. And he has become a pioneering director, hasn't he? Yeah. Yeah. He was, he was great. Never, you know, it's... It's funny with directors. Sometimes they, I thought Michael was very, uh, he was very unobtrusive, really. I mean, he just kind of let you go. With that, I remember. Mm-hmm. Do you do you get recognized for this more than anything? <sighs> not not anymore. Uh, God. <laughs> <laughs> Thirty-five years for Christ's sakes. <laughs> I know, but it's... So one, uh, well, yes, once. If somebody mentions it, yes, but not. Oh wait a minute, that's not true. I remember just last year I was at an airport and one of the TSA guys recognized me. Mm-hmm. Couldn't put his, he couldn't put his finger on it. He just kept going. You look awfully familiar. You're nice and juicy. Here I am in the TSA line. I wanted to remember the right thing. Yeah. So, so I so I mentioned two movies, and that was one of. Them. And he said, that's it, that's it. <laughs> so, phew. Ah, well, I was off and running. I made the plane. Yeah, I mean, Tybach, he uh, he does a lot of screenings and um, a lot of events um, for the movie because it's such a cult hit, you know. Obviously, right now he's not doing it because of quarantine, but uh, he he does. I mean, the movie's got a huge cult following. It does. I, I didn't realize that myself until a few just... Oh, maybe, I don't know, 10 years ago, or yeah. they, did a, they did something in the city that I was invited to, and uh, I couldn't believe it. I didn't realize it was such a, uh, and then I then I went back and I looked at it, and my, it's still one of my sons, who was at that age, at that time, um, and he's 32 now, um, and he, in the, he remembers it in the 90s. One of because it was bad, you know, it was my, and he remembers it very fondly. It was very old movie, even then for he and his friends. Right. And then uh, you worked with uh, Stephen King on the notorious Maximum Overdrive. Yes, yes, I, yes, I did. Yeah. And uh, again, a great time. I mean, I, I played that character. I, I did that movie because I love Stephen King's book. And yeah. when they and they said he was directing it, I said, I did. I want to do it. I, it sounds like a hoop. And the character's name was uh, Camp Loman. Right. And I, and I heard, I nicknamed him Willie Loman's third cousin removed. <laughs> That's I had a ball with that character. We shot it down in North Carolina. Yeah. I'm so willing to. And what a great, what a great, lot of fun that was. Yes, yeah, Steve. Of course, Steve never, he never did it, he never directed anything else. But I think he thought, holy crap, this is a lot of work. I don't know. <laughs> he was, but he was fine. He was wonderful. I, I thought, it was just a good time. Good time at this this gas station out on a, on a highway that they <clears throat> had come up with and shut down traffic occasionally to shoot. Mm-hmm. Which will make people very happy, but it was mostly at night, so it was late. Yeah. It was a good time. It was another, uh, yeah, a good episode that was. And we got, they put us up. Uh, we uh, down on the beach, down in Wrightsville Beach. So it was uh, when you had a day off, you were right there on the ocean. It was, and I was at home. I was very happy with that. My wife, my wife came down and joined us. My daughter, my two daughters. Mm-hmm. Some wasn't born then yet. No. 
Yeah, he he's been very um, very self critical uh, of himself uh, on this movie. You know, he says that um, you know he was he was on cocaine the entire time, which is why he didn't do a good job. And he calls it a moron movie. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Emilio Estevez, he was good to work with, huh? Yes, everyone. I mean, again, it was, uh, and also, uh, what is, who went on to voice uh, Lisa in The Simpsons? Uh, Yardley Smith. Yep, Yardley, yes. He, yeah, yeah. Everybody, it was a, it was a good, it was a good, good time. I'm sorry. Stephen didn't have to, didn't enjoy himself as much as, but just, I mean, maybe that was in retrospect for him. Yeah. At the time, he must have been enjoying himself in that case. Maybe. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's a cult classic, too. You know, I mean, it's, yeah. it, it's got its fans. And it's got its haters, too. <laughs> Most movies do. That's very rare. Yep, it truly is. Any memories of the secret of my success? Somebody just asked me that in my interview a little while ago. Um, I did have. I mean, I well, of course, Michael, who is a, a wonderful, wonderful human being, and great to work with. We had a again a wonderful working time. Um, I wanted to do all of my stunts and that, but when I saw up a <laughs> I had to fall down the stairs after chasing uh, uh, Michael through the through the building. They said, "You want to do that one?" And I went, "Jesus, I'll kill myself if I do that one." No, <laughs> they had a great stunt guy there who did it for me and did a great job. I would have, I would have, that would have been the last scene if I'd done it. <clears throat> but uh, you no, know, again, a good time. Everyone. Everyone was good to work with. I thought Herb Ross was, he was a, he was a hard director, I thought. He was a bit uh, abrupt. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I've heard. I, I, that was his personality, I believe, too. Yeah, I've heard that from other people, that he was a gruff director, you know, because he, so, he was such a distinguished New York director, you know, that uh, when he did the movies, yeah, he kind of showed his, his dominance. that much, but I thought he was a little harsh on some of the younger people, I guess. Uh, but, you know, that's, that's part of the business, too. I mean, sometimes you got to run into right like that. that. That's the way it is. And, of course, um, Barton Fink, um, that, that must be a highlight for you to work with the Coen brothers. I did. I enjoyed that also. And with uh, John and uh, John Goodman. And Taturo. And, uh, that, that, and and uh, oh, and, and John Turturro, right? That's his. I think one of his kids were born when we were doing that. <clears throat> and oh, there was an, that was oh, that was Jason Robards thing I did many years with uh, John Lithgow and uh, the Hallmark Hall of Fame. That wasn't a movie; that was something else. Uh, John Turturro, his son, I think, was born when we were doing that. Mm-hmm. And. and uh, John Goodman, we had to shoot that scene like four times, three or four times. And we always shot it at the end of the day so they could reset it overnight. That was shot in a, uh, out on, out on, what was it? I was out on a set somewhere in a warehouse where they had built this, this hallway so they could burn it down every night. Mm-hmm. Torch it up. But and if they didn't like what they got, the next day we go in and shoot some scenes and whatever we were doing or they were doing and that's at the end of it we shoot I'll show you the minds of the eye boom <laughs> oh, come right to the part where you get your head blown off oh great it's great did you did you understand the script at all oh absolutely not <laughs> 
Yeah, it's a it's a hard movie to understand, but it's great. There's something about it that has a spark. I love it. I just I read it, and I have no bloody idea what this is. I mean, I can make sense of it in my own twisted brain, but I have no idea what they meant by it. So you just kind of grab your own concept of it, and you run with it. And then when I saw it all together, I went, oh, you know, it kind of makes sense, doesn't it? And it did to me. Mm -hmm. Do you have a, a favorite of all the movies you've done? Of movies? Yeah. I, I guess, I, the only ones that I really, I guess it's the two of uh, the, the Slap Shot and The Last Dragon, only because they're the ones that seem to keep coming back. Yeah. Uh, as far as participatory that I was involved in, there were some that were done for like Thames, television in England called The One and Only Phyllis Pixie, which I really loved doing and enjoyed a great deal. That was uh, with Leslie Ann Dow um, and myself, I played her husband, and Bill Bag, who was a uh, stand-up comic in the 40s, 30s and 40s. Mm -hmm. uh, his name was Jack Tracy. He was, and he was a real person. And Les and, and uh, Phyllis Dixie was to Europe what Gypsy Rose Lee was to us, to the States, in the Second World War. Right. And she became one of the famous strippers uh, of, the t of the time. And a uh, tragic story, died of breast cancer at 60 years old. But a fascinating, uh, it was a docudrama. And I got to be on stage doing old vaudeville routines with her, with Leslie Ann, playing my wife, which was, I don't even know if you can find it these days. Mm -hmm. It was a wonderful experience doing. I really enjoyed doing that movie. Um, I guess I like Slapshot because it was just a big party. Yeah. Um, which is, and, and I also, uh, this was a TV series, which I loved, wasn't a movie. It was called Remember When, W-E-N-N, mm -hmm. AMC's, AMC's first scripted show. Nice. It was at a radio station in Pittsburgh, 1939, 40, 41. I don't know if it went into 42, I can't remember. But uh, that was a joy to do, very hard work. Well, another one of those 16-hour days, we shot, we shot half-hour full episodes, uh, four days, with 16 millimeter, one camera, mm -hmm. for half hour. And so the work was grueling, but the rewards were pretty pretty spectacular. That was uh, Rupert Holmes wrote, the, wrote the most of them. Wow. Kalata. Yeah. Yeah, he's a pretty good musician. No, yeah. What, so, so what did you start doing uh, voiceover work? Yeah. 
doing a character voice for a commercial, a radio commercial for a serial, and the fellow oh, across from me was talking like this and saying, um, if you want her now, or don't forget, if, I said, wait a minute, I'm leaving after doing this spot, he's staying and doing six more. So I said to my agent, I said, gee, I'd like to do the announce part. He said, no, no, you, they won't let you do the announce part, you can only do well, come on, we give it a shot. He said, no, no, I said, well, give it, give it a try. So eventually I did get in and managed to break into that, that announce world after a while. I said, okay, great. This is so, the voiceover world became wide open. I could do characters and I could do announcers. And that kept things going until the next, the next film or television game. Mm-hmm. Are you still doing um, theater and on-camera stuff when quarantine isn't happening? Uh, no, not no. New York just opened like this, just what this last week. Mm-hmm. For um, and I heard, and I just heard yesterday that maybe closing out again. And that's for the that's for the uh, episodics that are known in the city, like Law and Order, SVU, and uh, uh, Blacklist, and I don't know what else. I Someone else said that some commercial uh, studios are beginning to crank back up. Yeah. I don't do it anymore on camera. I have it a few years. I did a movie last year, a short, uh, called How the World Ends. Right. Six minute, it's a six-minute short, um, which is on my site. Where, but he, he did it, it was a, as a favor to a friend of my, of my son's who was trying to sell it to a greater audience to make a feature out of it. And it was, uh, it was, it's, everyone dies in a pandemic, okay? How was that? That was last year we shot that. Yeah. So, we talk about bloody timely. Yeah, it's cr- You know, most of the stuff I do now, I voice, so I have a studio in my house and uh, I can work out of, right out of here, you know? Yeah, of course. That- the technology is so great nowadays. I mean, you can just be at home or be on a yacht in the Caribbean to record a voiceover now. I, yes, you, well, you can, the yacht, it has to be a smaller yacht now for social distancing. No, you're <laughs> right. Uh, and a lot of people, Google just announced that they're doing stay at home until next July. I mean, more and more, not, not just in our business, but even singers are doing, are doing remote and, and combining them. With in editing, it's pretty amazing what's being done. I mean, the creatively, a lot of people are still managing to create. Although, for the for I really worry about Broadway. I worry about the stage for especially. Sure. Until until this gets cleaned up, it's really devastating the industry. And uh, and film is also. My son is doing a thing with uh, uh, down in Philadelphia, and he doesn't. That was for HBO, who's filming that, um, the mayor of uh, Eastwick, I believe it's called, mm-hmm. with uh, Kate Winslet. Wow, wow. <laughs> but uh, they don't know. Nobody, know. nobody knows when they're getting back to do it again. My daughter, my oldest daughter, was doing a show on Broadway uh, that was supposed to go in May, April, something like that. Mm-hmm. And the, they're now scheduled for next spring. So I really do. It's been insane. It's not. It hasn't been anything like anything I've ever seen in my lifetime. And I never thought I would see something like this. Now, do, now, do you do stand up, Tommy? Is that what you do? I'm, I'm going off script here. But... I did for ten years. Yeah. Uh-huh. I've, I've taken a break the last couple of years. The last and the last six months or four months forced. So. Yeah. yeah. It is. 
questions. Did you have any uh, projects uh, lined up before the pandemic? I did not. No, in fact, I, my wife and I were off on uh, traveling uh, from February, and we got back the beginning of February, and we finished traveling. We got back to New York on the fifteenth of March, and it was like the world had changed mm-hmm. and that from that time. From the end of January, beginning of February, where it was. No one heard much of anything about anything until the 15th of March when everything was going to shut down. Yeah. God. So I had nothing. I had nothing lined up. There was, if anything was lined up, I never No. It was just the voice business and that was it. But I, no one knew. And there it was. Everything stopped. Yeah. Well, hopefully after all of this um, is over, you, you can get back to work and stuff. That's good. That's really good. Well, Chris, I thank you for coming on the show today. This has been a lot of fun. Bobby, thank you. Thanks for asking me. I appreciate it. Good luck to you and good luck to all the people who are listening to your podcast here. And uh, keep on trucking. My pleasure. and Thank you, sir. And uh, you stay yeah. safe and have a great day. Same to you all, too. Thank you, Tom. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Well, there you have it. Chris Murney. Ain't he a cool dude? Very nice man. Humble man. Great journey in acting. Um, If you like this video, everyone, please subscribe to my YouTube channel. Add me as a friend on Facebook. Join my Tommy Kovac comedian page on Facebook. Follow me on Twitter and Instagram and all that fun stuff. Well, that's all the time we have this week on Splat from the Past. Until next time, this is Tommy Throwback Kovac saying... There's no shame in living in the past because the present sucks. Later, dudes.